start on the lecture. Um, uh, we have our first assignment, which is going to be part of our Majors Biology pages. And I'll show you that in a second. And um, this actually started out when we used a different interface called Moodle, where they actually had Wikipedia. And so you could actually create kind of like a wiki, um, which are linked web pages um, that would could be used as sort of a review of all of the information that we go over in this class. And so I have the first topics. And so you're just going to kind of randomly, like we'll be, we'll be just picking the topic. And then um, I'll tell you what you're going to do with it. Okay. So I'll mix them up a okay. <laughs> so once you get these, you probably want to write down your topic in your lab notebook because I discovered that people. I like I last time those were the papers. I don't know what's. I guess I should have. Okay. So then you want to write down your what you um, picked in your notes. And then you'll notice when you go to Canvas that there is a new assignment. Okay. So, oops, when you go to your Canvas web page and you go to, oh, this is all messed up. You go to Home. Okay. Right here is the Majors Biology pages. And so this is kind of like a summary of the topics that we covered during the quarter. And then if you click on it, it gives you some of the major topics. And these kind of branch, so they kind of become smaller and smaller. So um, evolution, obviously, is a major topic. So when you click on evolution, then it talks about um, some of the different topics within this. And one thing that we talked about was um, microevolution. And so if I click on microevolution, you'll notice that there is nothing there. Okay. So one of you got microevolution. And so what you're going to do is you're going to write a definition of microevolution. And then you're going to find a really good example of it. And then you're going to kind of write up a summary with references. So you're not going to put it directly in here yet. You will eventually just be able to hit edit, right? And you'll be able to put it right in here. So you could even like make that capitalized if you like. And then you would write it. And you can actually also link images. And you could also link to YouTube videos, OK? So the other um, place where you're actually going to first um, put in your assignment is under assignments. So you want to leave that and save that. OK, so this is your first wiki assignment. So you'll go to this, and it says, you have begin a, given a talk of topic excuse me, to research in class. And this is, that was today. And you're going to turn it in um, by next Wednesday, I think it is. is that, does it have a due date on here? So next Wednesday is the due date. And what you want to do is it just needs to be, you could put in um, it into a word. So you want to make sure that there's a 300 word minimum. And that you also need to, to include references. And so I didn't have the ability to make sure that I was referencing things appropriately when I was a student. And so actually, this is really useful to go to these citation machines and then just put in where you found the information. And then it gives you how to cite the website, or how to cite um, the journal article, or whatever your citing is, if it's a newspaper. And this one actually goes as specific to scientific reports. 
And so you probably know that there are different formats, different citation formats. So if you are like writing uh, a paper for psychology, it might be slightly different format than if you were writing a science paper. Okay, so you also want to um, uh, be aware that this is a Turnitin assignment. So how many people have used Turnitin in here? Okay, so you're not going to be docked if initially your assignment comes up with red flags. So what we want to do here, the whole kind of purpose of this, is to introduce you uh, and try to get you to communicate in a kind of a clear, concise, scientific way, um, uh, kind of complex ideas, and then to learn how to reference them appropriately. So you want to come up, you want to try to you know, make sure that you don't, don't just cut and paste stuff from the internet because what's going to happen is, is that it's going to come up and it's going to say 90% of this content has been plagiarized. Okay, So then you'll have to do it again. So you might as well do it right to begin with. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you put things in quotes if you're using direct um, statements from the internet. Um, otherwise, you want to try to put it in your own words so that it doesn't um, go to the internet and find exactly the same sentence that you wrote in another, a paper that somebody else wrote. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So if you have questions about your topic, you can just email me or come to me after class and I can help you clarify um, what it is about your topic that I um, would like you to write up. Okay. Okay, so that's the assignment for Wednesday. Okay, so we were talking about um, the evolution of endoparasitism. And so it is believed that the flatworms all evolved from a free living ancestor. And so when you look at these cladograms, one of the things that you'll notice is, is that there's some things that are like way back, right? And then there's some things that are like way up here and, and evolved more recently. And so we say that this is an ancestral characteristic or an ancestral trait. And what that means is, is that the organisms that gave rise to these three groups all had, all were free living and that was an ancestral trait, okay? When we look at this trait like right here, does anybody remember what the cestodes are commonly referred to as? What is that? Cestoda. Tapeworm, okay? So lost digestive tract, okay? So this is actually what we would um, describe as a derived trait, right? So you think, oh, well, they're more simple. They don't have a digestive tract, so that must be, like, be the ancestral trait. But what this means is, is that we think that these organisms had a digestive tract. You could put also a digestive tract here. And their digestive tract is like the cnidarians in that I'll put incomplete so that there is only one opening to their digestive tract. So they have an incomplete digestive tract. So that's that line right there. Okay, so that was ancestral. So losing their digestive tract is something that happened recently to them. Okay? And it is an adaptation to living inside of the host digestive system where they can simply absorb nutrients directly across the surface of their body. So if you're living in the small intestine of an animal, why would you need your own digestive system? There's nutrients just floating around in the small intestine. You're just like sucking it up through the surface of your body, right? The trematodes, on the other hand, have maintained their digestive, digestive system, but it is simpler, right? But they haven't lost it. So that's what the derived trait is called. So everybody understand how that's kind of put together? Okay. So I want to talk about, okay, the life cycles. And so we talked about the tapeworm, and we talked about specifically cat and dog tapeworms, and how the intermediate toast is a flea, and how sometimes we can accident accidentally get those tapeworms. But we do have our own species-specific tapeworm. And these are beef, right? Or let's not use beef. Let's use cow, pig, 
and fish. Okay, so there's three different major groups. Some use the cow as the intermediate host, some use a pig, and some use a fish. Okay, so if we look at the life cycle, we can say that the adult tapeworm resides in the intestine of the host. Okay, and then I have a line. So um, what has to happen is, is that the adult is reproducing and the eggs and the, or the larvae or the offspring somehow have to get to the outside. And so the packets of eggs So remember those packets, those segments were called proglottids. The packets of eggs leave the host with the feces. So that's a common way to get your um, offspring out of the host, right? We'll talk about some other ways that you can do it as well. This isn't your life cycle. So then, the eggs are picked up by the intermediate host. And eaten. So that intermediate host could be a cow that has the, where there's human waste in manure, right? Or pig or fish. So from the intermediate host, the eggs hatch out and the larvae insist in skeletal muscle. So why do they insist in the skeletal muscle and not elsewhere in the body? Right, so that's what we eat, right? So in order for it to complete its life cycle, it's gotta be someplace where we're gonna consume it. So this would be humans eat meat contaminated with larvae. Okay, and then the adult gets into, or the larvae get into our digestive tract and they develop into the adult. Now, in order for this to be successful, it has to go through the intermediate host. So there is a problem, and you might have seen like these crazy videos of people with um, tapeworms like insisted in their brain, right? So, so somebody like had, was like, freaking out and they went in, they did a scan of the brain and they found a larval tapeworm, right? And that's because if the eggs get eaten by humans, the larvae do not know what to do because they're in the wrong host. And so they go and they insist in other places where they normally would not be, right? So this intermediate host, the, in order for the life cycle to actually work for the parasite, it has to go through these different stages. Are there any questions about that idea? Well, if it's in your brain, there's no way for it to get to its definitive host unless you're in a tribe that where we eat, eat people's brains, I guess. <laughs> so, so no, it will it will like live there and it could stay there for ever, but it will never finish its life cycle. It messes people up. So there's, I've, I wish I, there was, there's this really interesting video where this woman actually had a pig tapeworm larva insisted in her brain and they actually went in and removed it, right? So she was having all kinds of problems like speech difficulties, she couldn't remember anything, walking, you know. So there was obviously something wrong with her and that's what they discovered happened. But that's kind of the unusual, right? Okay. So. Let's look at the trematodes. So trematodes are not tapeworms, they are flukes. And um, they are flat, just like planaria. 
And um, if we look at um, the diversity, even like um, all, even like invertebrates have these parasites in them. One time we were dissecting a crayfish and we opened it up and it was filled with roundworms, right? And so we're talking about that, this, that these flukes not only live in vertebrates, but they can also parasitize things like insects, right? So it's, um, they're extremely diverse and almost every species has one of, at least one um, type of flatworm that parasitizes it. Okay, so if we look at the flukes, um, one example is what is called the blood fluke. And this produces what is called schistoma or schistomiasis. We'll just put schistoma. Okay. And the intermediate host in this particular case is a snail. And so this occurs in water. Yep. Yes, and we're going to talk about that. That they can be really greatly, dramatically affected by having being parasitized with the larvae. Okay. So the snail is the intermediate host. And the interesting thing about the blood fluke is is that the blood fluke is dioecious. Does anybody know what dioecious means? Has anybody seen that word before? This is versus monoecious. Uh, is that how you spell monoecious? Uh, I think that's how you spell monoecious. Okay. So dioecious means is that they are not hermaphroditic. They have separate sexes. And the female um, resides inside the male okay so the male actually has this little groove and the female kind of resides inside of the male and so they're in close proximity to each other so this is an example of a um, endoparasite that is not hermaphroditic so put not hermaphroditic you have to have a male and a female Monoecious means that you have the same, uh, yeah, so that would be, monoecious means that you can produce both, uh, that you're hermaphroditic, yeah. So these are not hermaphrodites. Okay. So if we look at a diagram of its life cycle, okay, so here's the human, and if you don't have proper sanita sanitation, the waste, human waste, can get into the, um, into the water. So the same thing happens is, is that the eggs of the blood fluke um, get into the water, and then they're eaten. Um, actually, they're not eaten. The, ciliate, the ciliated larvae actually burrow into the snail host, and they live their life in the snail host until they hatch out of the snail host, and then they swim, and then they actually burrow in through the bottom of a person's feet. And then they get back into the blood and then they travel back to the digestive system. So that's where they're showing that little square there. So the digestive system, and then um, they um, complete their life cycle again. Okay, so I have a little handout. We won't take time to do this in class, so if you want to practice, oh, is that you besides Rick? This just describes the life cycle of the blood fluke. And then on the back, we're going to talk about another specialized fluke. So you notice that the female is kind of in the schism of the male. And so that's why it's called schistoma. It's kind of weird. Schist means like, like a, a fracture, right? And so the female kind of lives inside that larger male body. Okay, so this is one, this is a um, parasitic life cycle that's got two hosts, right? Just like the tapeworm. But in some cases, we have multiple hosts. Oh, this is a diagram. So this is actually a, um, 
taken as an electron microscope picture. So anytime you see these really fantastic pictures that show the surface of it, um, that is an electron microscope picture. And so here's the male. Right? So this would be the male, and then this would be the female. And that's how they mate and produce eggs. Okay. <coughs> So the next one I want to talk about is, and I'm going to have to get my new topic, sorry, whiteboard. Okay. Okay, so the next trematode I want to talk about is a trematode that has the name um, dendro, I have my notes here. Let me look at some of these. Okay. Dichrocelium dendriticum. So we write this dichrocelium dendriticum. Okay. So this is the genus name. This is the species name. Remember, we talked about binomial nomenclature. And so this is a fluke that has three separate hosts. And the hosts are really um, interesting. The life cycle is really interesting because it influences the behavior of these hosts to increase the likelihood that it will be passed from one species to the other. So we can start um, in the um, cow. So interestingly, um, this is very, very common in Europe, but it is less so common in the United States. So like if we have cows, we don't generally have this problem, but like, if you, had a, if you went to Europe, their cows are almost always have this um, particular parasite. So the cow, the adult resides in the cow, okay, and the eggs pass out with the feces. Okay. We then have a snail that eats the eggs. So the larva kind of does a little damage to the snail in this particular instance in that once the larvae develop, they leave the snail and they leave and they're actually kind of just, they come out and they're packaged in what are called slime balls, okay? So we'll say that the larvae leave in slime balls. Well, these slime balls are then eaten by ants. Right, so they eat the larvae, and the larvae travel to the ant's brain. And there they subsequently affect the behavior of the, um, of the lar of the, excuse me, of the ant. So if you think about cows, now we have to get from an ant to a cow. And if you think about the cow, way that cows eat, they're generally not down on the ground, like foraging right at the ground where the ants would be, but rather cows kind of graze in that they kind of nibble the tops of grasses, right? And so what we have to do is we have to get the ant, or the parasite has to get the ant in close proximity to where the cow is feeding. And so we then have a behavior change in the brain um, that causes a change in the ant. So parasitized ants only travel to the tops of the grass and hang out all night, right? So they're kind of like zombie ants. Ants generally do not do this, right? Ants generally go back to the colony, but if I'm a parasitized ant, I don't go back to the colony. What I do is I climb a blade of grass and I use my mandibles and I clutch onto the blade of grass and then I just stay there all night. And if I don't get eaten, I come down and I behave like a regular ant during the day, 
and then I go back up at night, right? So this means that the parasite has affected the behavior of its host such that it is more likely to be passed to the next and to the final host, right? So the cow eats the ant. And then the adult is in the cow. So I have uh, another homework assignment, and this one is due on Monday. And all you want to do is you want to read about this uh, parasite and then answer the questions on the back of the sheet. So in some instances, parasites are actually really important to the functioning of ecosystems because they um, regulate the reproduction and survival of the other individuals. And so in this particular instance, the fluke influences the behavior of its host so that it is more likely to be eaten and you get a kind of a greater diversity in the whole ecosystem. So this kind of explains why some parasites might be really important in maintaining proper ecosystem function. Okay, so let's look at a di our image of this. So this is just an image off the internet that shows this life cycle, okay? So this is the adult fluke. It does have a mouth, right? And it does have a digestive tract. We saw, or you had a picture of this um, in your lab. This is the A, right? This is the um, first intermediate host. This is the slime ball. Right? The slime ball gets eaten by ants, and then the ants subsequently are passed or are eaten by the cows, and the larvae gets passed into the um, into the definitive host. Okay. So the next phylum that we're going to talk about is rotifers, the rotifers, rotifera, and this is actually a really weird group of organisms because they tend to be or they are microscopic animals so they're the smallest animals so when you look at pond water you know and you see amoeba um, or other organisms in the in there you're usually looking at not animals but these are very very small and they are actually a little bit more diverse and developed at, compared to the planaria. So they have a complete digestive tract. So they have a complete digestive system. And they have what is referred to as a pseudo coelom. So remember that the coelom is the body cavity, and pseudo means false, right? So a pseudo coelom is a false body cavity that's only complete or incompletely lined with mesoderm. They're called rotifera because they have these wheel-like structures that allow them to filter the water. And so I have a kind of a picture, um, a video of a rotiferin. And I haven't listened to this one. I've watched it, but let's see what. I'm not sure it has sound. Okay, so this is the rotifer. And so it's feeding, but it hasn't kind of got its wheel-like structure come to come out yet. So you'll notice what happens here. There it is, right? So it's got this wheel organ, and it filters um, the water for food. And then you can see the digestive system. Oops, that kind of worked, did well, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So that's a rotifer. So they are a little bit more complex in terms of their structure than the flatworms, even though they are microscopic. Okay. So um, here's an image of one, right? And so notice that they have a mouth and they have an anus. That means they have a complete digestive tract. They have a body cavity where their organs sit. So that structure, we also see, we saw the kind of the digestive gland and the stomach working. 
This is kind of the opening to the mouth, right? And this is the wheel-like organ. So if we look at where these are placed, and so I handed out two alternative um, phylogeny. This is the one that's molecular. So if we look at where these are placed, here's the platyhelminthes, here's the rotifera, right? And then if we look at the next groups that we're going to talk about, this would be mollusca and anelida. And notice in this particular instance, they have the roundworms and the arthropods separated out, okay? So the next group we're going to talk about are the mollusks. So you do not need to know these groups that we haven't talked about. So Stentophora, you don't need to know that one. Acela, right? You don't need to know Ectoprocta or Brachiopoda, Coda. Okay, so we're just going to move on to the mollusks. Okay, so mollusca means soft-bodied. So mollusk means soft. And this is the most diverse phyla in terms of all the different um, kinds of organisms that are um, found in them. So if we look at the diversity, we have like clams. Okay? We have squid. We have snails. We have slugs. I think I'm missing one. Things like oysters. Can anybody else think about what might be in here? What would you add to that list, do you think? Octopus. Octopus, excellent. There's also one that's related to the squid and the octopus that has a shell. Does anybody know what that's called? It's a shell. And it's a shell that's very famous, named for a, a, the very famous shell shape. A nautilus, excellent. We also have organisms that are called nudobronchs. And this is a name for a sea slug. And they're actually, um, of all the um, mo mollusks, we see that the nudobronchs um, are actually the most diverse in the number of species. Okay, so if we look at the characteristics that make it so all of these organisms are in this group, okay, we would say one, these all have a muscular foot. Okay, however, it has been modified into a tentacle in some. Okay, so it has a muscular foot. So in some, it has become the tentacles. The other characteristic that all these organisms have is a um, mantle. And so a mantle is a tissue that secretes a shell. So even though some of these organisms have a dramatically reduced shell or have lost their shell, like slugs, right? Slugs do not have a shell. They still have a mantle. And we'll talk about its function in terms of um, terrestrial slugs. And they actually use their mantle to breathe, okay? So the third thing that characterizes these organisms is what is called a visceral mass. So viscera is like body organs, right? And mass suggests that there's more than one type of organ kind of pushed together, like glommed together. And so this means that the digestive and re reproductive organism, organs, excuse me, digestive and reproductive organs are one big mass, right? So they have like a liver, it's a digestive gland, um, and then their gonads, it's kind of all together, and it's called the visceral mass. 
Okay, so all of the mollusks have these three characteristics. So if we look at the different groups, we can see how they have diverged from the ancestral form and have become more or less complicated. Okay. So this is like your typical mollusk, and this is a picture um, from your book. So this is, it would be like a snail. So we have the muscular foot, and in this case, they use it for moving around. This is the, in green is the mantle, which secretes the shell. And then notice that we have like this intestine and stomach and digestive organs right here. And that is what is referred to as the visceral mass. So that big structure right there is the visceral mass. Okay. So you need to learn the classes of the mollusks. And so the first class that we're going to talk about are the gastropods. And this literally means stomach footed. Right? So the gastropods use their muscular foot to move around. And so there, it's kind of like their ventral surface of their body. right? So this would include slugs and snails. And this is the most numerous species. Right? So there's, there's the most species are the gastropods compared to like the cephalopods. Okay. We also have the clams, the oysters, and those other organisms. And they are said to be bivalves. So they're in the class bivalvia. So this means two shells, two valves, right? And so this would be clams, oysters, um, what else? What else do we eat that is? Oh, I can't think of. Mussels, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay. And then we have the cephalopods. And these are the head-footed. So remember we talked about cephalization and how that's the formation of the brain. So cephalo means head and pod means foot. So these would be the octopus, the squid, and the nautilus. So I didn't mention this one. Um, you don't need to know this particular one. But notice how this one has many plates. And it's actually called polyplecophora. And so you might see these at the Oregon coast. These are commonly referred to as chitons. And they are also considered mollusks. They're almost impossible to like pry from the, um, from the substrate, from the rock, because of their muscular foot kind of um, it causes them to adhere to the rock, and it's really hard to get them up off the surface. Okay, so here's an oyster, and oysters are kind of interesting because they swim. So they actually bring water into their shell, and so if you've ever seen them, sometimes they move like this right through the water. And they also have eye spots. And so remember that we talked about there was a cnidarian, the box jellies that had eye spots, right? The cubozoid um, cnidarians. But the oysters also have eye spots. So they can and not maybe not see images, but they can detect light and movement. This is a sea slug. So this is what is referred to as a nudibranch. And the nudibranchs are extremely diverse. And they're found, um, most diversity is in the uh, coral reef ecosystems. And like off in Indonesia, there's these big hot spots of nudibranch diversity where there's just tons of different species characterized by these little appendages. These are gills that they can use to breathe, but they're also um, a defense mechanism. And so these nudibranchs actually exhibit 
what is referred to as the acquisition of a trait or of a foreign genome. Actually, let's put just the acquisition of traits because I changed that. So remember how I mentioned that there's different mechanisms of macroevolution. And one of them is, is that you could just directly acquire a trait. And so with the jellyfish um, becoming photosynthetic, it's sting stingless. That would be an example of a trait. But this one is, I think, actually even neater. So nudibranchs feed on cnidarians. So this is actually a colony of polyps that you're seeing right here, um, kind of similar to Obelia that we looked at where there was a colony of polyps. And remember that cnidarians have stinging cells. So somehow they separate out the stinging cells and they don't know how they do this yet. They do know that they actually produce, the nudibranchs actually produce a mucus that chemically inhibits the firing of the nidocytes. So they don't want the nidocytes to fire, they want the nidocyte whole with its little nematocyst inside of it. And so they produce this mucus that prevents the nidocytes from firing. And so then they ingest them. And then they um, um, somehow they get them into their tentacle-like appendages on the surface of their back. So these appendages right here are brightly colored, and they also possess nidocytes. Okay. So they separate out the stinging cells, and then the stinging cells end up in the appendages on the back of the animal. So what this means is, is that the nudibranch now has a defense mechanism. It's not a defense mechanism that it inherited, but it's really, it's a defense mechanism that it ingested, right? So it, and so they don't really understand how um, all that works at a cellular level, but it's, it seems to work quite well. Okay, okay so we have another example of this um, where very similar to the stingless jellyfish, the nudibranchs become photosynthetic. And so this is a, um, a sea slug, and when they're born, they are clear in color, and after they start ingesting algae, the algae become incorporated into their cells. And so this is another example of an animal, animal becoming photosynthetic, right? So it relies upon sunlight. And then it actually you know, protects the algae, and it moves the algae around, and it provides the algae with nitrogen. So it's very similar to the symbiosis that you see in coral as well. Okay, so the muscular foot in the cephalopods right, has become the tentacles. So we see um, in the cephalopods, we see something um, very interesting in that these are actually active predators. And so we see that they have um, very complex sensory structures. So we're gonna talk about the eye in a minute. And then they have large brains, right? They're capable of pretty complex communication because if you've seen the videos of it, they could change color, right? So when like an octopus is really angry, it will turn red, right? Or if it's frightened, it might turn white, right? And so it uses color to communicate. And the squid actually flash, they're like neon flashes, right? And we don't even actually understand what all those flashing means. And so they have a very complex nervous system. And so what we see is, is that these guys have because they're active predators, um, have developed some really complex sensory um, and um, large brains, okay? So let's take a, take a look at the evolution of eyes. And what I wanna compare it to is the cephalopods. Cephalopods versus <coughs> vertebrates. So this would be like the eye of a octopus versus like the eye of a tuna, 
right? So a tuna is a fish, it's a vertebrate. Okay. So if we look at the um, characteristics of the eyes, we see that we have photoreceptors. Right? And these photoreceptors are located in the retina. So I'll just draw a couple of photoreceptors. These are actually rods. We'll talk about the eyes when we get to vertebrates. So these are my photoreceptors, and they're actually in the back of the eye. So we have in front of the, of the retina, and this is not to scale, but this would be like my lens. Right? And so light comes in. I should use a different color. Light comes in, right? And what the lens does is it focuses the light onto the photoreceptors, right? So these are my photoreceptors. Okay. So there's a different way to build a lens, and there's a different way to kind of arrange the photoreceptors. So if we look at the lens, we could, um, and we're looking at far away objects versus close objects, there's two ways to do it. So the lens, right, could move um, closer or further from retina. So this is to focus. So I'll put to focus. Okay. So this is like a camera. So if you think about your camera lens, right, you're actually, and watch your camera lens, it actually goes like this, right? The other way you can do it is you can change the shape of the lens. Okay. And changing the shape of the lens then would allow us to see things far away or close up, just like moving the lens uh, away or closer to, from the retina. Okay. Now the other thing has to do with the photoreceptors in the, in the eye. So the photoreceptors can be, can look like this, where they can have all of the nerve cells that connect them coming out the back, okay? And then it goes to the optic nerve. Okay? Or you could have your photoreceptors arranged like this, and you could have all of the wiring coming out of the front, and it could go around and then out to the optic nerve, right? So this is like A and B, right? And this is like A and B, okay? So it's just a different way to build an eye. Okay, so let's look at the octopus. Actually, let's look at us first. So how do you think we focus? So the octopus focuses one way, we focus the other. So does anybody know how do we focus on an image that is further away or closer to us? Do we move the lens or do we change the shape of the lens? Okay. Vertebrates change the shape of the lens. Yeah, not pupil dilation, but we actually have these little muscles that actually pull on the lens and they flatten it out and then they relax and they let the lens bulge. So vertebrates like us, we are B, okay? Octopus, squid, nautilus, they are A. It's just a different um, way to build the eye, okay? Okay, so how about this? Which way do you think, so this is light, I should put this. So this is light coming in. So which one do you think is um, vertebrate, and which one do you think is cephalopod? Which one do you think ours is? Which one makes more sense? A makes more sense, right? It's like, why would we put, like if you were gonna put a light detector, why would you put the cords out in front where the light has to come through, right? This is actually cephalopod, right?
Yes, right? So this is cephalopod. For some reason, I, our eyes are built like this. And it, does, it doesn't make any sense to me, right? But our eyes, we have all the nervous tissue coming out the front of the photoreceptors, and then they have to go back and then go to the optic nerve. That's our blind spot where it exits the, exits the eye, okay? So these are very transparent in us. So it doesn't seem to cause that much of a problem. But if you think about the squid, some squid live super deep, right? And if you go down there, the fish are all blind, right? They all like can't see anything, right? But the squid can see, and that might be because their eyes have a, seems like, if you're going to engineer it, right? It seems like you would build a light uh, receiver like A and not, not like B. Okay, so A is cephalopod, and B is vertebrate. Okay. Okay, so we have just one more group that we're going to talk about. Okay, so phylum annelida, or annelida, annelida, these are the truly segmented worms. And they are segmented both, both internally and externally. That says internally. And so I want to show you, like just if I just showed you a segmented worm, this would include earthworms. And I'm going to draw some thin segments and I'm going to draw some thicker segments. Okay. So there's my segmented piece of my segmented worm. These organisms have what is called a hydrostatic skeleton. So if you think about them, earthworms are really soft, right? So we'll put, I'll put what these are. So this would be earthworms, clam worms. Um, there's even a Christmas tree worm, which we'll talk about. And tube worms. Now, the ectoparasite is the leech. So leeches are also. Okay. But if you think about an earthworm, an earthworm is really soft-bodied, but it is really strong, right? And if you notice, sometimes in the spring, you'll be like walking over really compacted grounds, and what you'll start to see are these little holes in the, in the earth, and then there's little piles of dirt, right? And so they actually use their hydroskeleton to actually burrow up and really through really compacted soil. And so they're really important in aerating the soil. So they kind of help to aerate the soil and to break it up, okay? And they do this using their hydrostatic skeleton. So if we look at this, this is a segment that is filled with salomic fluid. And the walls of the, um, of the earthworm have two sets of muscles. So they have circular muscles. This squeezes the segment. And it makes it longer. And then we have longitudinal muscles, which shorten the segment, and it actually makes the segment fatter. Okay. And it does this by pressing against the hydrostatic fluid. 
So like if we're, if I'm showing you the circular ones, it would be like you have contraction like this, right? So that's the circular muscle. And then what happens is the salomic fluid presses like this, right? So this is light blue, but the salomic fluid presses out and it's gonna make it that segment get longer, okay? The longitudinal muscles are gonna contract like this. And what's gonna happen is, is that the salomic fluid, oops, the salomic fluid is going to push out like this. Right? So that segment gets um, fatter. And this whole process is referred to as peristaltic burrowing. And this is how a soft, bodied organism can burrow through very hard earth. It's peristaltic burrowing. Okay. And this is important because it allows for aeration of the soil. Now we have machines that do it, right? So those machines that go in and they pluck up, right? They're actually doing the work of the earthworms, right? So the earthworms would naturally aerate the soil and could pluck it up. And then it also, earthworms are kind of funny because they um, actually mix the nutrients, mix nutrients into the soil. So sometimes if you pay attention, they're probably not out yet, but this spring, if you pay attention, you'll look, you'll see an earthworm burrow and then you'll see like they're pulling leaves and other debris down into their burrow. And so it actually helps to uh, mix up the organic material so that the soil um, becomes more healthy. Okay. okay. So we'll finish up on the annelids. Your lab notebook, you're not going to turn it in this week. You're going to turn in your lab notebook next week. Okay. So um, just make sure that you bring your lab notebook and all your lab materials to class tomorrow. Remember that you have two assignments. One assignment is over the loop, which is due on Monday, and then the wiki um, upload to turn it in is due Wednesday. So if you have any questions, just let me know about, um, about your uh, topic. Let me know. I've given you an example of one. So here, let me see if I can find it. I forgot to mention that I have an example of one. Is this one just like information? Or yes. Or? So you can just put that in your notes. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a quick, quick, quick question? Yeah. Um, can I use the information because I do have like three methods? Can I use some of the information that I get for? Because it said like you can also look up information for the. Yes. So you could you could write that up. Yes. Okay. So you could use that as your Wikipedia too. So okay. you just happen to luck out there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I got it though. That, that uh, acquisition of traits. Oh, you could do the Nidarian one. Okay. Or the Seuss. Yes. Okay. Example of wiki entry. I forgot to mention this. So this is the example of somebody wrote this up. Oops, not there. Okay. So they had their sources and they just wrote it up. So it's kind of like just a summary of the information. So we put the date we did on there. Uh, no. I was gonna say on the bottom like it's source they put when or. This is, uh, this is, oh, so this is when they access the website. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, when you get your information from websites, you have to say when you ac access the website. Okay. So that citation machine will help you with that. Okay. 
it'll help you give you the right citation. I was thinking it was going to need to be like three or four paragraphs. But yeah. No, 300 pages isn't that, or 300 words is not that. Yeah, big of a. And then, um, so I got like ocean acidification, so should I put like how to stand do coral reefs, or just explain what it is? I would explain what it is, and then I would use the coral reef okay. as an example. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Oops. 